Welcome one, welcome all to our Evangelive the Verse. And today we are in the book of Isaiah chapter 60. Yesterday we were in Isaiah chapter 26 and we saw how Jesus Christ is the rock of ages. Today we are going to behold and marvel at the fact that Jesus Christ is the light of the world. I cannot wait to get into that. Isaiah chapter 60 from verse 1 to 3. For those of you who do not know, our verse of the day is taken from the Version Bible app verse of the day. And so it happened that today's verse was Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 3. But of course, we give you a little context so you know what's going on. Now, before we get into the word, allow me to say a quick word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are not worthy to open your scriptures. We are not worthy to speak on your behalf. We are not worthy to speak of you. But Lord, because of your grace, because of your love, even while we were yet sinners, you died for us. Lord, I pray that today you may open our hearts. And Lord, that at the end, uh, when you call us today, that we will not harden our hearts as in the days of provocation, as in the times of temptations, when we fell to temptations, as when we tempted you, Lord. Forgive us our sins, Lord, and give us understanding of your word. In Christ's name I ask, amen. Isaiah chapter 60, verse one to three, arise and shine, light to the Gentiles. That's the title of today's verse of the day study arise shine for thy light is come and the glory of the lord is risen up risen upon thee for behold the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people but the lord shall arise upon thee and his glory shall be seen upon thee and the gentiles shall come to thy light and kings to the brightness of the of thy rising now we know very clearly that Jesus Christ said of himself, I am the light of the world. John, the person who prepared the hearts of the people for his first advent, says of him, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. That verse 6 of John chapter 1, it continues to say, the same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lights every man that comes into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Now, without much explanation, we see very clearly that the prophecy of Isaiah 60 is very much concerning uh, Jesus Christ when he comes and lights the earth with glory and power. And there's a number of verses that can help us link these things together. If you read Matthew chapter 4, for example, from verse 13, it says, And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the sea coast and the borders of Zabulon and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Esaias the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, underline the word Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw great light. And to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. The word Gentile means outcast. Uh, basically, Gentiles means someone who is not a Jew. And now back in those days, the Jewish people were the chosen people of God. And so everything else that was not Jewish, everything else that was not Israelite, was considered Gentiles. What's interesting is that God did not choose Abraham 
from whence the Jewish nation came from, so that they should just be his only people that he deals with and then everybody else should be destroyed. No, if you read Genesis chapter 12, it says that God called Abraham and told him that out of thee shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. So when God called Abraham, the intention was not just to make Abraham his special friend at the exclusion of others, but that through him, everybody else might come into the fellowship of God. And so we see in this verse the fulfillment of that, where God is saying that there will come a time when the light, if you read verse 3 specifically, and the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and the kings to the brightness of thy rising. Now, that was never true more than when Jesus came into this world. Listen to this commentary by Ellen G. White. It says there that when Christ came into the world, darkness covered the earth and gross darkness the people. The living oracles of God were fast becoming a dead letter. The still small voice of God was heard only at times by the most devout worshipper, for it had become overpowered and silenced by the dogmas, maxims, and traditions of men. The long intricate explanations of the priests made that which was the plainest and most simple mysterious, indistinct, and uncertain. The clamors of rival sects confused the understanding, and their doctrines were widely apart from the correct theory of truth. It was at a crisis at this kind that the word, the truth, became flesh and dwelt among us. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything that was made uh, that was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness, and the darkness comprehends it not. We see a great controversy between light and darkness, the two antagonistic uh, elements in nature. Of course, we know that this represents nothing other than uh, Christ Jesus and the prince of the world or the, the, the devil, the adversary and Satan. It says, and the light shines in darkness and darkness does not comprehend it. He was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. He came unto his own and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as one of the begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Truth looked down from heaven upon the children of men, but found no reflection of itself. For darkness covered the earth, and gross darkness the people. If the darkness of error that hid the glory of God from the view of men was to be dispelled, the light of truth must shine amid the moral darkness of the world. It was the it was decreed in the councils of God that the only begotten Son of God must leave his high command in heaven and clothe his divinity with humanity and come to the world. No outward splendor must attend his steps, save that of virtue, mercy, goodness, and truth. For he was to represent to the world the attributes of God's character. But the world, unaccustomed to gaze upon truth, turned from the light to the darkness of error, for error was more to their perverted taste than truth. And so we see here that what darkness really represents, like we saw in another uh, episode of Evangelive the Verse, when we we're dealing with John chapter 1, uh, verse 3, uh, if not verse 4, which says light and life, we saw that darkness means ignorance. Darkness means sin. Darkness means anything that is contrary to God's way of life. Darkness means death. And so when the, when the text says that uh, the world is enveloped in darkness, what it means is that the world at that time uh, was enveloped in sin, in ignorance, in death, people oppressing one another. Religion was perverted. 
they were not worshipping God, they were worshipping their own religion. The world was wicked, they were worshipping idols. That's what darkness means, idolatry. Darkness means sin. But when Jesus Christ came, he came to save the world from darkness, to give us a clear understanding of what is the purpose of life. What does God want, right? Uh, what's the will of the Father? Is God really a father? Is he a dictator? Christ came to clear those things and give us light into understanding uh, eternity and things that matter the most. What is the value of our lives? He, he demonstrated that when he died for us on the cross to show that we are most valuable in his sight. Now, this is a representation of Jesus Christ coming for the first time. Uh, but what we do learn is that the prophecy of Isaiah, well, most prophecies in the Bible are multidimensional. They have a prophetic fulfillment in the Old Testament or at some time in history, but also have a prophetic fulfillment at a later time in the future, in the last days. For example, like it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be when the Son of Man come uh, again for the second time. And so when we read in Revelation chapter 18, we, we learn interesting things. It says there in Revelation 18, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils, the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hurtful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies, and I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues, for her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquity. What's interesting in both passages, both in Isaiah 60 and in Revelation 18, is that they were speaking about the same thing. How do we know? In both stories, the controlling city, uh, the controlling uh, nation at that time that was uh, causing darkness to dwell upon the earth is none, none other than Babylon. In the times of Isaiah, Babylon was the city that was conquering God's people, bringing uh, seeming, seeming darkness upon God's people, causing the people of God to be weakened. In the last days, we see Babylon causing the nations to be mad and and as a result they 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 uh, ignore God and increase in sin what's interesting is that God says come out of her my people and we see a lesson that God has his people even among the Gentiles God has his people even among those who we think they do not have a relationship with Jesus those whom we think I have not heard about Jesus. God has his people everywhere. Like Jesus said, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. They must also come and join this fold. And so Christ is predicting a time when the church will be united under one and there will be only one church of God as opposed to the one side that represents darkness. And so there will be a polarization where there will only be two people in the world, those that obey God and keep his commandments and those that uh, deny God or choose to rebel against God and create their own commandments. This is an interesting prophecy. This angel that lights up the earth again, we do not have to guess. It's Jesus Christ because he's the only one that has the power to light the world. He is the light of the world. What, he, what will he be lighting? He lightens the world and warns them. What does it mean to light the world anyways? Of course, the text explained what it means. To light the world means to tell the world, to uh, let the people know. That's immediately as found in the text here. 
And that's the same thing that Jesus Christ did when he came into the world, when he says that he is the light of the world, it means he, he has the knowledge, the words given him of the Father, and he gives these words to the people. But the people did not accept what he was saying. They said his words were too much. They say that his words were not true. They wanted to stone him and to kill him. The same thing has to happen in the last days. Light must dispel darkness. And the people of God that are in ignorance which is what darkness also means must come to the light to the knowledge of truth and that's why the knowledge the gospel of the kingdom has to be preached unto all the earth before uh, the end of the world comes it should be for a witness when christ came into the world everything was going the wrong way he thought god was this dictator uh, the jewish priests and rabbis were enforcing upon people uh, to to uh, righteousness by faith basically if you want to be saved you have to do something to be saved but Jesus Christ came and clarified those things now even in the last days the condition of the world uh, in the last days or when Jesus Christ comes for the second time will be the same thing as when he came for the first time listen to this the condition of the world at the time of Christ is well described by the prophet Isaiah. He says that the people were found transgressing and lying against the Lord and departing away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood, and judgment is turned away backward, and justice stands afar off, for truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter, yea, truth fails. And he that departs from evil makes himself a prey. And the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. And he saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore his own arm brought salvation unto him, and his righteousness is, it sustained him. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate, and a helmet of salvation upon his head. Isaiah 59 from verse 13 to 17. The condition of the world previous to the first appearing of Christ is a picture of the condition of the world just previous to his second advent. The same iniquity will exist. Satan manifests the same delusive power upon the minds of men. He is setting his trained agents at work and moving them to intense activity. He is securing his army of human agents to engage in the last conflict against the Prince of Life, to overthrow the law of God, which is the foundation of his throne. Satan will work with the miraculous representations to confirm men in the belief that he is what he claims to be, the Prince of this world and that victory is his. He will turn his forces against those who are loyal to God. But though he may cause pain, distress, and human agony, he cannot defile the soul. He may cause affliction to the people of God as he did to Christ, but he cannot cause one of Christ's little ones to perish. The people of God in these last days must expect to enter into the thick of the conflict. For the prophetic word says, The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keeps the commandment of God and have the faith of Jesus Christ. I want to challenge you to open to the book of uh, Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12 speaks of a woman. Uh, this is this woman is interesting when you read the description it's rather uh, fascinating there it says that uh, there was a woman that was clothed with the sun let me just open there for you and let's read together revelation chapter 12 uh, there it says and there appeared a great wonder in heaven a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she being with the child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. Let's just focus on verse 1. This woman is clothed with the sun and the moon is on her feet. And on her crown, on the head, she has twelve stars. What? 
This is nothing other than Isaiah chapter 60. Isaiah chapter 6 it says, Arise and shine, for thy light is come. What is this woman doing? This woman is shining. You have all the representations of light in the universe, at least the known universe. And God created the great lights. This, this woman has everything that light is. This woman is the light of the world. And that's what Jesus Christ calls us. He says, you are the light of the world. I am the light of the world. I give you the light. You share the light. That's why every person who follows Jesus, his life must be evangelistic. His life must be a life that shares the good news, a life that shares the light. The devil hates light. The devil hates truth. And if you stand for the light or even the right, the devil will fight. We must stand on our guard. We must arise and shine. For our light has come. However, we will face opposition. We will face opposition. And in conclusion, I want to finish in the book of Ephesians chapter 5. Friends, we are called to arise and shine so that those who have not had the opportunity to know the truth may know the truth and the truth which has the power to save us, the truth which has power to transform our lives. They also need this salvation. The other day we looked at how we should pray for everybody because God wants all men to be saved. He's not slack concerning his, his promise, but is long-suffering to us, what, not willing that any should perish. Now, if he does not will that any should perish, we have to be responsible for giving them the light. We have to arise and shine. Listen to Ephesians chapter 5. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things are reproved, but all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time. For the days are evil. Well, the days are evil. We just saw that in in uh, uh, well in Isaiah 60 that the 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 world is enveloped in darkness, in the ignorance of sin, in the ignorance of God. Like they do not know who God is. They rebel against Him. It's our duty to make manifest, to tell them that uh, that is evil and that is good, to show them the way, the truth, and the life. I hope, as hard as it can be, that you will give your life to Jesus and accept him to use you as a conduit or as a medium through which his light splashes across the world because that's his business. God, Jesus, is in the business of shining, making known his ways. Shining, making known the truth, making manifest. Light is what Soyafa makes manifest. I hope that today you will make manifest Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Thanks for listening. And I hope to see you tomorrow for another uh, verse of the day.